um, at Blaffer Art Museum. And uh, we are pleased to do, this is the second day of two days, um, two afternoons of artist talks uh, featuring the, uh, the, the uh, artist from the UH School of Art 43rd Annual MFA Thesis Exhibition. So just to tell you all a little bit about the exhibit, it is up right now at Blaffer Art Museum and it will run, in, run through Sunday the 11th. Uh, and each spring, Blaffer and the, school, the University of Houston School of Art uh, proudly present the works of the MFA degree candidates from the School of Art's five studio programs, which are graphic design, interdisciplinary practice in emerging forms, painting, photography, and digital media, and sculpture. The exhibition showcases highly developed bodies of work that are a culmination of an artist's studio practice. And each of the artists uh, is also invited to give an artist talk. So um, we're gonna be excited to present those today. The format for the talks is that each artist will have about eight to uh, 10 minutes to present, I mean, eight to 10 minutes to present and then five minutes for a Q&A. There is at the bottom, um, there, on the bottom, there is a reactions um, icon on the tab. And so if you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, do so by just raising your hand. Um, if that doesn't work for you, feel free to jump in. You can also uh, put the questions into the chat if you'd like. So those are just some notes. Um, be sure to, if you're not uh, speaking, uh, mute, mute your mic, of course. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce our first uh, participating artist today, uh, who will be Marky Dewhurst. And you should all now be seeing uh, an installation view of some of her work. Uh, Marky Dewhurst is a Houston based artist whose work focuses on the psychological qualities of images conveyed through a figurative drawing, painting, and collage. She holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and is currently um, receiving her MFA degree in painting with, in the concentration of painting. Uh, Dewhurst has also studied at the Glassell School of Art, the New York Studio School of Art, the Vermont Studio Center, and she, and she has been uh, part of many exhibitions in Houston, including those at Lawndale Art Center, Williams Tower Galleries, Kinder Morton <laughs> Gallery, and East End Gallery. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for that introduction. And Thank you to everybody at the museum. This has been a really important step in our MFA finale and I'm very grateful for all the support. I am going to share some thoughts about the work I've done during my MFA, but I'll start by remembering that at one point in time at the University of Georgia, I was actually an undergraduate sculpture major. I was carving stone and thinking about plaster and lost wax, but over time, I became a painter in part because of the process, like smelling linseed oil and mixing paint and the chaos in my studio, working on multiple paintings at the same time, and then calling on some mysterious criteria to know when they were finished. I now find my interest in painting lies with the psychological qualities of the images I make and how I can connect them to some sort of narrative or implied narrative. I use the figure to create characters, characters with all sorts of imagined complexities and layers like private motivations or buried damage or personal entanglements. And it's those kinds of complexities that make me think about what are these characters up against and how are they going to navigate the worlds that I created for them? I often use imagery that is ambiguous or distorted because it represents complexity for me and in part a language that I personally identify with. I learned to understand things through a kind of visual filter when I was growing up. I think of it as a, a cocktail of extremely poor eyesight and intense shyness. It made me socially awkward to be sure, but I did become a pretty keen observer and through my really bad eyesight, I learned about how shadow shapes were substantial. And later I understood how they could be used as 
building blocks for invented people and invented spaces. Now I find this completely influences the way I approach art making. I also found I could add little bits of detail within these shapes. And that was really interesting, the idea of a sliver of clarity surrounded by something kind of murky. Those inclusions of evidence brought out my own particular predisposition for exploration. And these strange blurry environments were my chance to explore in a new way, which just happens to be the skill I used for years and years as a former exploration geologist. I would also say that while I find strangeness and psychological intrigue compelling, I keep in mind that they are really a kind of stand-in to think about experiences or creating and solving problems and understanding why I feel the need to contribute and be relevant. So I have two types of work in the show, digital photo-based collages and paintings, and both represent exactly how I work. The collages are about sifting through imagery, kind of puzzling shapes together and searching for some kind of psychological condition. The paintings are a little different. I start with a source image constructed just like a collage, and then I start to paint. But of course, my initial intention is eventually changed by reworking the paint over and over and over again, wiping, layering, drawing, moving existing forms and using the remnants of earlier images to create new images. You know, for example, a tiled kitchen floor may become a seabed or fingers may end up as a river delta. A once too large head might become a mirror with some kind of elaborate frame or drapery from a skirt might become a cliff face. It's always an adventure in looking and I'm always in favor of turning a painting upside down and sideways to look for even more potential. And I, I think we do this all the time, you know, like looking for something recognizable in uh, cloud shapes. You know, as a kid, I certainly saw my share of animals in wedding dresses staring out the windows on car trips. Okay, so how did I get to this point in my work? Well, when I began the MFA program, I was making what I like to call perfectly adequate paintings, but I knew there was something of substance missing and I needed a new way of looking, which I personally found through collage. I stopped painting and started taking photos of my family, my friends, my artwork, interesting objects, fossils, maps, environmental patterns. I digitally modified them to black and white and used a filter to distort the focal range of the images. Then I cut them up and assembled new images. Then I reassembled those images again and again, looking for something with just enough peculiarity to hold my interest. And it turned out this assemblage of different parts to create the strangeness and narrative that I was after was a really important step for me. I created a whole series of these characters that hang at the entrance to the big gallery right now. And I'll have titles pulled from Edgar Allan Poe lines like a wild weird climb and from the same source I have not taken. I absolutely have an affinity to Poe and it just seemed a match that was fitting. Uh, then the, these photo-based collages led to a series of large, mostly black and white grayscale paintings. You see them hanging on the big wall in kind of salon style. And the sharp edges of the earlier fragmented pieces of the collages kind of gave way and the transitions were more subtle but the influence from the collages really helped me populate my paintings with content and made them more interesting to my brain. Um, I have one painting in the show I'll kind of call out as an example, it's called Cigarette and Tea. I sorted through piles of cut up photos to create a source image, which included things like the mouth of a well upholstered 1940s gangster like uncle with a cigarette dangling from his mouth teacups from my mother's Irish china set she bought when she was a Pan Am stewardess in the early days of commercial flight. Uh, there's a round security mirror in the hallway at my son's high school, uh, the desk chair from my first geology office, 
a shape defined by a scar on an elevator door at a hospital, a hand drawn like a reptile claw, and the body of a painting I made maybe 10 years ago at a Houston Artley class. I merged all of these time variant parts of my life into this image and had the figure trying to engage the viewer by offering tea and hoping the ashes from the cigarette miss the cup. It's really a portrait of myself, you know, complete with oddities, strange references, and some personal mystery that I feel all kinds of connections to. Anyway, I'll, I'll start to wind down by saying that after a long seduction with painting in black and white, color started creeping into my most recent paintings. I'm not sure if this was a response to the isolation of the pandemic, but it did seem I needed to add balance to that heavy experience. But even more interesting is that the same phenomena happened in my closet, which for my entire life has always been filled with only dark, really dark clothing. Sometime in the middle of COVID, I not only started painting in color, but I also started buying clothes with color, like my brand new, very orange dress with fringe. Who knew? <laughs> While it seems color is creeping into my life right now, um, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But, um, but don't read anything into the fact that I'm wearing black today. Uh, it's probably just I'm paying tribute to the bulk of my MFA work. Anyway, uh, I think I'll wrap up with that. And thank you very much for listening. And I'm really happy to take any uh, questions that you've got out there. Hi, well, I do have a, a question to start us off, which is, um, I was wondering about the relationship between the collage and the painting. So like, uh, do, do you ever do studies? Do you ever use the collages as studies or how does how's, how do are those things connected? Um, yeah, that's actually how I start my paintings is I put together a collage and um, I'll, I'll make collages for themselves, but I'll also make collages uh, to begin a painting with, although I have to say that I, uh, I rarely stick to that image once I get going. Uh, my work changes so much when I actually start the painting process. But yeah, the collage part as uh, source image is really important. Does anyone have, um, what other questions do we have? Uh, you can just raise your hand or you can start talking or add something to the chat. There's... I have a question. Um, could you talk more about the salon style hanging and um, how the, the different um, portraits you created, how they relate to each other? Um, yeah, this, I, okay. When I walked into that room, it was the ceiling that it, it's a huge wall and I thought about a lot of things. The first thing I thought was, okay, I, a lot of my work is, thank you for putting that up, Catherine, um, is that a lot of my work is, is very traditional in the terms of it's an oil painting on a, on a piece of canvas. And um, so I wanted to not hang it in sort of the, the typical manner where it's, you know, just one line straight across the wall. And so, I decided I would like go to a throwback and hang it a little bit salon style. So I could like, I wanted to just own that wall and uh, put it up there and uh, made it big and made it have this relationship with the wall. And also I like the idea of the salon style because all of these characters that I, that are up on the wall there, they, they do relate to each other. They're all pulled from the same kind of, uh, source imagery or the same way that the same constructions where I'm pulling together all types of things from my life and, and, um, and putting them into the different paintings. So, yeah, I think of them as, uh, as a group and they, you know, they speak to each other. So yeah, there's big connection. And oh, the other thing was because of the way that I, I make collages and start paintings, it's with pieces making a whole. I looked at that wall and I thought, pieces making the whole there were the individual paintings, which were like pieces coming together in a salon style to make a hole in that wall. Are the paintings that, 
that are featured on that wall in Salon Sale, were they done at a certain time or did you kind of visually and thematically connect them? Um, they were all done in the last uh, about a year. So uh, yeah, and I have others that I've done similar to them. These were just the ones that ended up on the wall. So they're closely related, certainly time-wise and what I was thinking wise. There's a question in the chat uh, from Erica Lee, uh, which is asking, uh, which is saying that I've noticed that you don't frame your works uh, on paper. Is there a reason behind that? Or do you see that practice continuing? <laughs> um, so I like physically working on, for big paintings on unstretched canvas. There's something I like about it feeling raw and it feels less intimidating. Um, is cheaper. Um, I also like <clears throat> that I can modify if I want in the future. Um, and I, you know, because there's a lot of narrative that I'm trying to put narrative or um, implied narrative that I'm trying to put into these paintings, sometimes I think of them a little bit because they're in black and white as uh, you know, they remind me of illustrations in really old books. And so I think about the pages of books and uh, yeah, I don't know. So all those things tied together. So will I continue that in the future? Yeah. But I will say that it's interesting while I like working on unstretched canvas and I uh, typically show it that way, every time I've ever sold a painting, it, it always gets immediately framed because nobody wants it on unstretched canvas. And there's another question in the chat from uh, Doug Welsh, which asks, um, what artists have influenced you? I'm sorry, what? What artists have influenced your work? Oh, um, wow. Uh, uh, certainly uh, painters like uh, Edward Monk or um, going way back, Rembrandt. Um, newer painters, uh, 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 wow, there's so many, it's like, <laughs> it's a little overwhelming, but I would say that I have a really broad range of influences from way back to the current. And um, I, I, and strangely enough, one of the painters that I really am drawn to is this uh, Aboriginal woman named Emily, I can't pronounce her name, but I think it's Emily Kame Kaganawara. And um, her work is stunning. And uh, I think of her as one of my heroes, even though her work is really, really different from mine, but she's not only influenced me in, in looking at her work, but it's also, you know, she started painting when she was 80 years old and she created, you know, I don't know, over 3000 works of art magnificent pieces. And so she's a, a real personal inspiration too. And another question has um, has popped up from Runa Lesser and she's asking if Alice Neal influenced her, you. No, you know, for a long time, I didn't actually know about Alice Neal, but at, when I discovered her, I, yes, I was absolutely wowed by her and I'm, I'm loving seeing her get uh, uh, more, more uh, notice these days. Well, I think um, our time is short. Uh, so I just wanna um, uh, see if there's one last question maybe, or final thoughts. Okay. No, well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Marky. And we are now uh, going on to um, uh, the next artist that we will feature today is Marley Foster. Uh, Marley Foster is an artist, writer, and educator from Houston. She earned her, B the, her BFA in studio art and also uh, uh, in English from Rice University and currently is, is completing her MFA in sculpture. Uh, in, in her studio practice, Foster reconfigures domestic fabrics and objects in order to question the institutions of home and family as they relate to the American South gendered labor and middle-class aesthetics. Uh, her work has been featured in, in Homemaker Suburban Taxidermy at the University of Houston Third Space Gallery, 
in traveling virtual exhibit called uh, Making Way, Artists Responding uh, to the Coronavirus. And most recently in Southern Occupation, A Lady's Guide in the New Elgin Street Studios. In addition to her studio practice, Foster writes art, art criticism, most recently for Houstonia Magazine, and has also recently published a piece of aesthetics uh, theory in, and <clears throat> on aesthetic theory and the environment in Green Theory and Praxis Journal. Uh, Foster currently works at, as a teaching fellow at the University of Houston and also as a teaching artist at Art League Houston. So welcome. Thank you, Catherine, um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, it's really great to get the opportunity to talk about our work and hear um, everyone else in the show talk about their work, um, especially since we've been isolated for so long and not in direct conversation with each other. So I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so as Catherine said, I want to I want to start the talk by just speaking about my work a little more broadly, and then we'll get into a couple pieces that I think show important moments of transition in the practice. So I, in my first year in this program, I started using a lot of stuff that was coming out of my mother's house, which is the house that I grew up in, as material. I'm really invested in domestic objects and recontextualizing them because I wanna simultaneously honor their history and their original function as things that we live with in our homes, but then do things to them, change them enough that we see them in a different way and are sort of forced to reckon with them. Because I have started to think about domestic objects as like really playing an active role in indoctrinating us into systems of power and social norms. Um, so although homes can be spaces of comfort, they're also really involved in our society in a political way. That's, that's sort of my big, my big theory for how all of this is happening. Um, and like Catherine mentioned, I'm interested in the domestic, not for nostalgic reasons, but because I'm interested in uncovering, you know, as these sort of primary places where we're taught how to be people, right? Um, when we're raised as children, like what are these houses doing to us in terms of teaching us about class and race and gender dynamics and labor? So those are sort of my big conceptual ideas or problems that I'm working on um, and using domestic items to work through those things. So a lot of my materials are things that have literally come out of the house that I was raised in or that have been given to me by friends and family um, or that I've scavenged you know, from antique stores or thrift shops. And they're all sort of indicative of Southern middle-class or upper middle-class white neighborhoods, which are very particular and that positioning is very important to me. Um, on a personal level, I think it's important to be very aware of where I come from and how that affects the way that I move in the world, because that's the only way that I can ever um, change the way that I move in the world and interact with other folks. So can we flip to the next slide, please? I think that's enough of a, of a sort of general overview. So to get into the works in the show more specifically, when I started this program, uh, I was thinking a lot about homes and houses and the bodies in those houses, mostly thinking about how female bodies operate in these homes. Um, they can be sources of both comfort and confinement. And so I was making sculptural forms that suggested bodies, um, but that didn't actually deal with real bodies or with weight. I was making a lot of big stuffed things, soft sculptures that had volume that suggested weight, but didn't actually deal with anything that was you know, literally or physically heavy. Um, so this piece that you see on the left, the blue triangle hanging over the chair is the first piece that I made that actually grappled with weight instead of just suggesting it. Um, and with the chair had a more direct, more directly evoked 
a human figure. So this piece um, is called The Things We Carry. The blue triangle is a curtain valence. So for those of you who may not be familiar, this is a purely decorative portion of a curtain. You would have the like big long panels that actually cover the windows, but then these little triangle pieces just run along the top to sort of cover you know, the curtain rod or whatever you've got up there. Purely decorative, serves no function. Um, and this is a piece that came out of my mom's house. It was hanging there for, for probably 20 years. Very typical of like, 90s, 2000s, Texas suburban style. Uh, and hanging, like attached to that curtain are about 50 brass knobs that came off of kitchen cabinets. And so they're actually, they're very heavy. They're actual brass and there's a lot of weight there. And then I've hung it over this, this wooden captain's chair, this kitchen chair um, that I think is a familiar fixture from a lot of a lot of homes. And so this was the first piece that actually dealt with weight. And I was thinking about physical weight, but also the way that that physical weight could evoke sort of mental and emotional weight. Um, I think the the triangular object starts to read, like, when it's on the wall like this, starts to read like a flag. It's sort of the shape and size of the way that a flag would be folded um, and given to families of a service member who has passed away. Um, we've got several of those in my family. The, the brass knobs start to read as brass buttons, maybe evocative of old military uniforms, especially when they're on the blue fabric. And then the chair, the chair is such a stand-in for human presence, right? It's sort of suggesting someone who could be here but isn't present anymore. And to me, that's sort of a, a mournful thing, um, that absence. So that, that sculpture is really important to me for those reasons, um, but also because I, I made this last year and also during 2020, I started making images and portraits, which you can see in the, the middle photograph where this blue thing is hanging over my face. So when the world fell apart this time last year, and everything shifted online, I was sort of at this point in my practice where I was thinking about weight and thinking about bodies in a different way. But then I also had to start thinking about how my objects lived. Um, everything was gonna be digital. And so I started thinking about, you know, how can I create objects that can live as objects in space, but also live in images. And while I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about putting my own body in the work instead of just suggesting a body or sort of dancing around the fact that I come from this place and I'm sort of complicit and involved in the dynamics that it has taught me. Why don't I actually enter into the work? So there's a real body and I'm making an appearance in the work for the first time. And so I've created a series of portraits, one of which you see here where I start interacting with my sculptures and my object. And so my body is a body, but also kind of turns into the architecture a little bit. Um, and I'm sort of trying to deal with where I fit with these sort of recontextualized things. And some of these objects and portraits I've actually put back into the house where we come from, because I'm interested in that like additional step of recontextualization that happens. Um, so that's sort of a track of the work I've been making the past about two years. Um, and right now, as I'm getting ready to leave this program, I'm feeling another shift in the work um, where I want to look at these issues and these questions in a little bit more of a future facing way. Like my work up to maybe about two months ago was sort of really focused on like mining the very recent past in this like domestic history and personal history. Um, to see what I could uncover. And now I'm in a place where I wanna take that knowledge and what I've learned from that and see what happens when I move forward with it and I make it something um, much more current. So I'm thinking about that in terms of the way that I interact with my objects. Um, I've started using a lot more of my objects as like props or costumes. And then this piece here on the right, um, this is a grid of nine images where I have taken a series of uh, ceiling fan blades and strung them together 
and I'm wearing them in all these different poses as a collar, as a hat. Um, and I've sort of had the, done this like private performance in my studio and photographed it. And then I, I selected nine of the photos and print, printed them on organza. So it's this sheer, really lightweight, beautiful fabric and stitched them together as a grid. Uh, and I'm really interested in that form because the grid to me simultaneously speaks of quilting. I have a background in quilting and sewing that's very present in a lot of my work. But at the same time, it starts to read as a grid on an Instagram feed or on social media. And so I'm like right now, I'm really excited to think about uh, interacting with my objects more, but also starting to question space instead of just focusing on the architectural space of these kinds of homes, also starting to think about how that gets complicated by digital space, um, which exists both nowhere and everywhere, and I think has the potential to be like really radical and subversive when a digital space is brought into sort of a quote unquote real space. Um, so, okay, I think, I, I'm not sure how much time I have left, so I think I'll, I'll stop it there, um, but if anyone has questions, I'm happy to talk a little more. Um, in addition uh, uh, to the sources for your work that you've already mentioned, um, I have, I was wondering whether the th there are also like literary and artistic sources that you're looking at, particularly like, for example, the, the things we carried um, you know, there's, of course, the novel uh, by Tim O'Brien on that book. Uh, and I was wondering, if, since you've got a military kind of feeling reference in there, mm -hmm. if that relates. Yes, um, really loosely it does. I read that book um, years ago in high school, and it really stuck with me. Um, so I'm not interested in making super um, in-depth reference to it, but... I have very intentionally sort of bastardized that title for two of the three pieces that you see here um, because I'm interested in how the domestic and the, the sort of personal and intimate relates to the national and the public. Um, and then of course that book I believe was about soldiers in the Vietnam War, right? So like there's of, of violence in that and a national, like national questions that come up in that text um, that through like my titles, I'm sort of interested in saying, like like seeing how that relates to the intimate personal within our homes and like toggling back and forth between those two things. Um, and I, I read a lot, like I, I couldn't tell you like other specific texts just because I'm reading all the time. Um, but in terms of artists, there, there are a lot of artists that I look at, but especially with my um, images, when I started making images, I looked at Martha Rossler's photo montages a lot where she's got these really slick, like gorgeous interior design photos. But the longer you look at them, you start to realize that in the photos are images of war or images of conflict and violence that are sort of, um, really jarring because they're not the first thing that you notice in the image initially. And so I think she's sort of playing with some of those dynamics too, of like public and private, violent and domestic and how the, like collapsing the two in, in collage. And I'm sort of interested in doing my own version of that. Like that's sort of what I feel like is happening um, with a lot of the portraits that I've been making. There's a question in the chat uh, from Liz Gates. I think we mentioned gender norms uh, in the beginning. Can you talk a little bit more about how the, they're articulated in the work? Yes, so that's a lot through um, process and the kind of labor that I do. So not as much in these three images right here, um, but like a lot of my practice is rooted in sewing and ways of working that are traditionally considered women's work, right? So both of my grandmothers sew, taught me how to sew. That's a practice I've been um, exploring my entire life. So I'm interested in those forms of labor. Um, and like the materials that I use are all from homes, right? And I guess like 
in terms of gender, I'm rereading your question, like gender more norms more specifically. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about the, like that kind of work. Like, what does it say that I am like a young feminist woman? And at the same time, I love sewing. I love interior design, like could watch HDTV all day. Like I love those things, but I also recognize their complicated history. And I'm sort of interested personally in saying like, well, can't I, can't I have both? Can't I be both, right? And so for me, it shows up in the work in the materials um, and in the processes that I use. Um, I'm thinking about it right now in terms of, of a lot of the self-imaging that I'm doing. Like I'm taking all these photos of myself and making them pretty large and putting them in the work. And that feels a little weird. Like that's still pretty recent. Um, and it feels a little weird because it it's about like taking up space, right? And I find myself questioning like, how am I taking up space? Should I be taking up space in this way? What does it mean to have all these pictures of my face? Um, and all like having sort of all of my like intersecting identities on display. Um, and I've gotten some mixed feedback about it, but that's, yeah, that's something I'm interesting, interested in exploring further with these newer pieces. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Marley. Our next uh, presenter is going to be uh, Veronica Gaona. Veronica Aguiona is an interdisciplinary artist uh, living and working across the Texas-Mexico border landscapes. Informed by the transnational identity and sociopolitical climates, uh, Gaona creates an ongoing dialogue between her own body and the land to investigate notions of architecture, migration, and death by conducting uh, location-driven research. In 2019, she traveled to Marfa, Texas, and Nantes, France, to take part in DUST, a residency working uh, at the intersection of spatial practice, critical theory, and contemporary art. She's been published in Critical Storytelling on slash from within the borders. There's a lot of punctuation in there, um, um, I can't convey, <laughs> uh, it, which is an anthology uh, published by Brill Sense. In the summer of 2021, she's exhibiting her work at the Museum of Contemporary Art at Tamua Limpas, Mexico. Uh, currently, she's completing her MFA in photo digital, media, photo digital media and is an instructor at the School of Art University of Houston. So welcome. And thank you, Catherine, and thank you everyone for being here today in these artist talks. Um, like Catherine said, working from the border and being a first generation Mexican American family from a family that has migrated frequently uh, and has relocated to search for employment. Um, a lot of the work is coming from that experience and then another part of the work is coming from living so close at the border and seeing a lot of the uh, a lot of the political climate there, right? And so some of it is coming from my, my own migrant experience and then the, the other one is a lot more social and political driven. Um, so working as a, at the border, I use my position of insider and outsider as a tool to bring migrant spaces to life and center them at the center of these immigration policy debates. And um, also as a border dweller, it's hard to escape the ideas of location, dislocation, frontera. So working on site, um, the dualities are always at play, demanding that they be negotiated. The inability to draw a line and choose from what side I belong has caused me to instead use the border as my reference point to deconstruct oppressive paradigm and allow a number of different perspectives to surface. By expanding the idea of border, I'm interested in the intersections of local and foreign as it, told, as, as it relates to displacement, 
brought by globalization. I examine how the border allows me to consider different perspectives, um, such as my experience, the international immigrant, migrant worker, and the Mexican American experience. It is through this lens that I, I understand the border as complex and a constantly shifting phenomena triggered by local and international movements. So from that, from that specific point and from that perspective that I brought, um, I want to start talking about the work that is a lot more social and political driven, which is this body of work. Um, this piece is called Arrastrado, Swept Away. And it's made out of Fabriano paper soaked with asylum seeker re remains, rose water, Rio Grande water, and dirt. And the material for me is really important um, because it's site specific. And I, I hope that the spectator, when they experience the work, their sensibilities while, experience, while experiencing the work is triggered, right? And um, is not just passively um, experience it, uh, but critically thinking about what, what, what the material is and what is the material saying. Um, this piece is a response to the events that um, slowly happened in 2018, where a lot of asylum seekers could not cross the port of entry between the southern tip of Texas, which is Brownsville and Matamoros. And, but how in January, 2019, the federal government of Donald Trump executed the migrant protection protocols or also known as the remain in Mexico protocols by the federal government. And how starting in January, 2019 until recently, gen, um, recently in, in 2021, um, a lot of refugees were able to cross the port of entry, but they're still in that process, right? And I'm, I'm talking about those events and how a lot of asylum seekers um, were along the edge of the river in Mexico, in Matamoros, and how they they basically stayed there. They did, they did many camps there. So it was almost like a mile long of camps in Matamoros. And they decided to not leave how, not leave the proximity, the proximity there because they wanted to be seen and not forgotten. Um, a lot of the times when, a lot, throughout the years that they've been there, even the Mexican government we're trying to tell them to leave the proximity to to the bridge, but they kept, you know, persisting not to not to move them because if they were to be moved to a stadium or to churches or to housed um, places, they were going to be forgotten and not be seen. And so they they stayed there for years in just camps and. Here, I'm, I'm talking about those issues there. Um, there's another piece, there's other pieces where I explore these same ideas. Um, can we go back to the other one, actually? I'm sorry. There's, there's another piece in, in the exhibition at the Blackford where I, I explore these same ideas, but in a different form. Um, there's the humidifier piece where I humidify uh, Rio Grande water. And that one is called Eternos, Eternal, a homage to Teresa Margolles' work. The other part of my practice um, comes from my personal experience and the remittance landscape. And the remittance landscape is basically how money is being uh, produced by migrant workers in the host country and how that money is being transferred back to the homeland. And with that money, how family members and workers build futures back home. 
in, in their presence and in their absence. And so I'm interested in, in that remittance house. I'm interested in cemeteries and how family members plan their death, even before they're dead. And because these structures that are built are, are markers of self-identity, of selfhood. And it is through these structures that and we, as a migrant, uh, coming from a family of migrants, it is through these structures where we, we kind of we, we materialize the idea of, of a of a ident identity that is stabilized because living across borders, our identity is always destabilized. Right, we're away from home, uh, relocating to find employment, and. And the house is the house that I'm interested in. The idea of the remittance house is evidence of my family willingness to migrate, to improve our circumstances, and to disperse family members right across geographies, and uh, attempts to get a better life. And those ideas are materialized in a series I made called Las Casas y Nosotros. And we can go ahead and move to the next slide, please. There's a, a photo series in the exhibition that I am exhibiting called Las Casas y Nosotros, The Houses and Us, which proposes the idea that remitting and migration is performative in that the laborer constructs houses, but at a distance across international borders. And the photos, and capture the multiple sense of being in relationship to identity and place experience in my family history. And um, another, another idea within the remittance landscape is the idea of death and transfers and translados, which is the remitting of cadavers over long distances, even after death in the homeland. And this piece here, for those who do not return in life, there's always death, is talking about the idea, the idea of transfers, the idea of uh, the desire to be buried back home. And this piece is, uh, is a rare back F-150 stationary window with white vinyl. And a lot of research goes behind a lot of this, um, I've interviewed family members. I look at building receipts. I look at land papers. I look at end of life planning. I look at repatriation papers. Uh, my family's, uh, my family, some of my family members that have passed away, and how all these documents that you have to present at the port of entry in order to transfer the body. I look at those, but decide to leave all of that behind to instead make sense through material. Any questions? There's an observation in the chat um, from Brandon. Uh, the Harris, and it says amazing work, Veronica. The notion of of death is is present in all of your bodies of work. Why do you see yourself drawing drawn to the subject better? Right. Thank you, Brandon. Death um, is the theme that connects all the body of work. Uh, migration is the umbrella, but I feel. Death is the glue that puts my, all these ideas together, right? And death for me is how living and working and trying to find, uh, trying to improve uh, your situation in life 
um, how death is basically an experience where we basically find um, stability. Death is very, for me as, a, as uh, in my migrant family experience, death is where we can finally rest after a, a lifetime of migration of movement. Death is, is concrete, right? right? And it, we can finally rest. Right. And also thinking about the, the deaths at the river, um, I think about how asylum seekers have passed away in the riverscape, and I'm interested in, in their life before and their life after death. That's why some of the pieces are more concrete, like the paper piece, and other pieces are a lot more ephemeral. And the ephemerality of some of the pieces, um, I think about their, their lives before and their life after death in the riverscape, right? Because the riverscape is essentially living, it's a living body, right? And so I understand that death is not solid, but it's, it's, a, it's a circle. And I try to materialize the, all of these ideas going on in my head and through, through different presentations and through different material. Other questions? I think there was another one in the chat. Okay, um, what is it? I've missed it. Uh, so someone volunteer to say it. Okay, I think I, I there was something about um, the number of uh, pieces put together in the large piece. In the yes, so the number of papers uh, is significant, and for the Blaffer show, I was only able to put a certain amount of papers because of the space that we shared. Um, but this body of work is made will be made um, out of 2500 and more paper pieces so i'm thinking this piece will take will take over a whole room and will be experienced as a installation and the each paper um, is is uh, is thinking about each individual that and lived for a little bit at the migrant camp in Matamoros. And there were over 2,000, 2,500 2, migrants there. Uh, do you wanna let us know, are there any upcoming projects that you have on the horizon? Or, or, or what other directions that your work is going from here? I do. Um, there's there's another body of work that I want to make, and as it relates to the remittance landscape, and um, I'm thinking about um, using concrete again. I used concrete at the beginning of my practice, and but then stayed away from it. But now I feel like I can I can go back to it. I want to encase. Uh, I want to encase a urn that has migrant remains inside of it, such as hair and fingerprints, into concrete. So basically, a burial. I want to make a burial, but of a small urn. So it's going to be a small piece. So I'm still thinking about ideas and presentation. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, everyone. So the next uh, artist that will uh, will uh, be up is Wanda Harding. Uh, Wanda Harding is, based, is a Houston-based artist whose work explores notions of individuality within community through the use of vivid, vivid abstract paintings of bimorphic forms. 
She's currently completing her MFA in painting and prior she uh, holds her BA from Texas A&M University. She's been part of several juried exhibitions, including the Lawndale Big Show, for which she was inc included in uh, Betsy Huerta Big Show Top 10 of 2018 in Glass Tire, uh, Texas Visual Arts, uh, the Women's Museum at, at uh, Fair, Fair Park, Dallas, and the Kinder Morgan um, in Houston, Texas. So thank you very much. Uh, Hi, thank you. Thanks to everyone listening and thanks to the Blaffer for the opportunity and for organizing. And um, fair warning, there are lots of mixed metaphors ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, 2020, a year where politics and a pandemic further, oh, hang on, I'm gonna switch here. Um, further the divide in our country and in our communities. For solace and strength, I sought out occurrences of cohesive communities in nature, communities acting for the good of the group, communities where they help each other thrive, such as forests. Forests are much more than a group of trees. In old growth forests, elaborate interspecies networks communicate and transmit nutrients underground. The trees, understory plants, fungi, and microbes are connected, interdependent, and communicative. They give of themselves by sending nutrients to ailing members, even those of different species. Like forest systems, the forms in my paintings live in symbiotic relationship. I paint communities of disparate biomorphic shapes that keep their particularity while contributing to the collective. No shape more valuable than the rest. All singers are valued in this choir. The paintings evolve organically with each form laid down in response to its neighbors. Individual forms emerge through hue and value changes, each further differentiated through brushstroke, texture, translucency, partial erasure, or layering. The shapes read as discrete, self-created, complete forms, but in fact, they are interdependent. As I paint one, it alters the outline and color of the shape next to it and even the shapes which follow that. Borders are negotiated. Sometimes shapes maintain crisp borders. Sometimes one shape is glazed onto part of another shape, blurring the border. Sometimes the shape scratches into its neighbor. In some places, the forms are coming together. In other places, they're pulling apart. Some overlap their neighbor forcefully, some slipping in beside one another. Ultimately, my work is premised on the belief that ideas and emotions can be conveyed through purely formal means, such as color and composition. Each shape's particularity is valued as it negotiates with the others a healthy maintenance of the whole. I've come to think of the conglomerates as puppy piles because they seem to be cozy, nestled in with each other like puppies sleeping. It wasn't until I'd painted many puppy piles that I realized the centered composition of the clump causing the together yet alone together in this environment uh, reading of the work reminded me of my childhood. I'm one of seven children. And while we had a big immediate family, we had almost no extended family. We moved a lot and I was painfully shy. So definitely huddled into my family for strength. But seeking our tribe for comfort doesn't just apply to me. This is a universal drive. We humans want, even need to belong. We create groups so that we feel like we belong when actually we all already belong to this country, all of us, and to this planet. As artist and writer, Michelle Grabner told me in a critique, form is always about order and order is always political. My work raises a question beginning to percolate today. Is it time to re-examine the postmodern idea of dismantling systems? Is it possible to build holes, H-W-O-L-E-S, with values of collaboration, consensus, interdependence, and balance? Would that negate the downsides of holes, such as exclusion and groupthink? Okay, so let's look more at the paintings. 
Um, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, in the dark one, you can see that the conglomerate integrates with its background, but still maintains a figure and ground relationship. The figure reveals itself slowly, carrying a light closer and closer to us through the darkness. There's a sense of shapes nesting, belonging to each other, and perhaps their environment. In the other painting with the diagonal lines, I wanted the background to evoke a sense of an organized system, such as the forest systems. And I didn't want it to appear rigid or mechanistic. I wanted the conglomerate to carry a sense of being upheld by this organized system. So I painted the handmade geometric background with a group of shapes centered over top of the, that geometry. All of these angled lines coming in, we don't see where they meet. So there's something that's invisible that we have to imagine. In the normal logic of a handmade geometric painting like those by Harriet Corman or many others, the logic would be to see how the handmade geometric patterns create a composition and a different kind of space. Are things coming forward or going back? What's the relationship? But since the meeting of the geometric angles is overlaid, it remains mysterious while the angled lines push the clump forward like a meteor or a planet hurling through space. The paintings evoke various communities, an aerial view of a forest canopy, a pile of laundry, a map. The painting with the angled lines resembles what is said to be the world's oldest city, Chital Hayuk. In this Neolithic city, homes were built in a clump, abutting one another just like my shapes here. The citizens walked over each other's rooftops and entered their home through a hole in the ceiling containing a ladder. Rooftops were the city's roads. An aerial archeologist rendering of the city bears a striking resemblance to the structure of my paintings, especially this one. From puppy pile to polis, P-O-L-I-S as in city, uh, based on archaeological findings, Chital Hayuk was egalitarian financially, all of the homes were the same size, and egalitarian in treatment of male and female with the same diet, jobs, and other factors. Is this what Carl Jung, founder of analytic psychology, might have called a synchronicity that I painted communities of egalitarian shapes whose structure closely resembles the first human city, which happened to be egalitarian? Um, some of my newest paintings are like the large one on the left. If you could go back to the first slide. I began painting these on unstretched canvas on the floor in a looser style. They are different from the puppy pile paintings, which are made one shape at a time, slow, methodical, a color or shape is considered before being laid. In those, <clears throat> excuse me, in those I'm organically building something. Each form is affected by its neighbor's shape and hue. In the looser paintings, I'm walking around and on the canvas, tilting it to control pores and the spread of stains, wiping off paint, drawing forcefully with pastel into wet paint, all resulting in a different feel. The shapes have more elbow room, more expansiveness. Perhaps the puppies are growing up and doing more than sleeping and nursing. Maybe they're playing, even wrestling still in community, but developing as individuals. With the paintings here, with all these paintings here, while each shape is not pre-planned, the process is fairly forthright. With the looser paintings, it's like I'm discovering something, working fast, changing on the fly, hunched over the floor. I'm digging through the dirt and roots to find bones and shards of pottery, uncovering a community, out of the muck. As I push forward with various processes of painting and integration of more content, I'm aware that both will consciously and subconsciously drive the work, but always at its heart will be entities belonging while keeping their particularity and supporting those in the pile with them. Charles Darwin and E.O. Wilson said, Self-interested humans fail more than they succeed and communities made mostly 
of survival of the kindest types succeed more than they fail. Knowing that we already have the science to approach life together this way is hopeful, along with the fact that more research is being done every day to support this. As Professor of Forestry and researcher Suzanne Simard says in her book, she has, quote, a quest to prove that the forest is more than just a collection of shapes. So too, I work trusting the paintings are more than just a collection of shapes. Thank you. Uh, should we open up to, to any questions? Yes. There is a an, an observation in the in the chat. Um, if everyone can see it uh, from Pilar Figueroa, uh, said, which says uh, that I like how the shapes uh, agglomerate and relate to each other chr chromatically, like society. What's next for your work? Future projects and directions. Oh, I really like that um, that idea about chromatically like society. Um, and that is part of choosing a palette is I, I, I want a wide, um, a wide palette, lots of colors, um, largely for that exact reason. Um, uh, so for future projects, uh, as I briefly mentioned, I, I really want to incorporate more um, content into the work. Um, could be from forest networks or could be looking, um, aerial views of forest canopies. But I, right now, I, you might tell I'm especially excited about this um, Neolithic Chital Hayuk. And they, it's got tons of ideas and tons of visual components in this city that I want to mine, like um, I wrote some down here. Um, they painted geometric wall paintings in their homes that are, are really visually interesting. Uh, I could incorporate these into shapes or backgrounds. Um, uh, they may, they believe they made the world's oldest map. This is which is also visually attractive. I want to make use of, and even layouts of the city itself um, would make um, good compositions for the piles. Um, I might, uh, oh yeah, and then some of the imagery they made with their sculptures and, um, and paintings. Other images are bulls, heads, bear and leopard drawings. And I love it that they made a lot of um, figurines of women, older women, um, overweight, very sagging and everything, but they were, these sculptures were found in um, honored places in the city. And some of them seem to be seated on a throne like chairs with carved leopards in them. And um, so that, that seems really ripe for a lot of work. I'm also interested in perhaps some immersive um, ex installation thing where someone really feels a part of these community of colors and shapes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit too about your, just about your process working um yeah like they're the uh, as i mentioned the process is is kind of different for each of the paintings these the two here that are on on the slide right now it um it is a, a more of a methodical step-by-step -step thing um and each color and shape is responding to the previous one and all the others already in existence in the in the collection, but um, it's not planned out ahead of time. Um, and, but a lot of re reworking comes in later with layering over or glazing or sometimes changing a shape, um, but mostly just altering the colors to create rhythm through the piece. We have time, thank you. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Okay, well, thank you very much, Wanda. Okay, thank you. There are two more artists who will be presenting today. Uh, we'll start with Jamie Hart. Uh, Jamie Hart is an artist currently living and working in Houston. 
whose practice concentrates on the slippery transition of everyday experiences into discrete objects. He received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting from the Cleveland Institute of Art in 2014 and is currently uh, receiving his MFA in, with concentration in painting. His work has been included in publications such as Reciprocal Magazine, Art Maze Magazine, uh, Lula Japan, and New American Paintings. Selected solo exhibitions include Pistachio at Gray Contemporary in Houston, Texas, and at Automat Gallery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Slow Pace Time Front Gallery in, in Houston, Texas. He's the recipient of artist grants from Vermont Studio Center and Houston Arts Alliance. And his work is represented at Gray Contemporary in Houston. So welcome, Jamie. Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read some statements. Um, some are from me and some are from other people. So. Objects cannot make direct contact with each other. They require a third term or mediator for such contact to occur. Objects are always more than their discernible qualities. Reduced to a line, a point in space, a tiny interval, a boring sequence of banal events or objects appear to visualize forms of near paralysis. Tactics involved in this kind of project may include a focus on the sheer mereness of things in order to shake off the delusions of meaning. Another would entail developing a humorous syntax of weakness, a kind of language endlessly undoing and undermining itself. Making a meaning out of the refusal of meaning is a means to resist the temptation to stuff the world full of meaning. Form is the illusion of certainty. To disappear, scarcity leans against an attention economy built upon increasing universal visibility and access. Approach objects with equal parts doubt, necessity, and care. The varying shades of invisibility in things are the collateral manifestations of underlying structures and global systems that define value and significance. There is nothing we can make an object of cognition, nothing that can exist for us unless it becomes an image, a concept, an idea, unless that is, it stops being what it is in order to become a shadow or an outline of itself. Tending to objects and places is an acknowledgement of the reality and value. The sensitivity in the mundane, asymmetrical geometry of stains and parking lots, flattened and torn paper cups, letter forms and symbols and languages I don't know, staring at the tops of trees looking for birds. Middle mixtures in color, have wide orbits of potential change in relationship to other colors. They hold equal distance from multiple possible source values, which allows them to fluctuate in ways that force uncertainty into the process of looking. In the presence of red, one may appear green. In the presence of green, one may seem red. It is both and it is neither. This middle can feel like a margin. There is nothing wholly abstract, entirely other, or fully disconnected from the lived environment, if the lived environment includes history. Paint is a material of entombment and containment, the ground of experience or the world as a web. It is free to notice and focus on minute fragments for extended periods of time. Everything there I rely on physically and conceptually 
is accessible because it is not valuable. Continuously coming to the recognition of the potential purposelessness of making something can be a tool to recognize the potential consequence of one's decisions. The buffering state is always much larger. To see something as a complex process, always built upon mountains which only show their peaks, not seeing as similarly complicated. Readiness to hand for Heidegger refers to the simple but peculiar observation that things seem to withdraw from visibility when they're functioning. A hammer becomes part of the hand when it's in use. When it is no longer in operation or is not functioning properly, it reappears as a discrete object. Not seeing something does not mean it is not there, but rather that it's withdrawn. It remains hidden from view and invisible because it's functioning. The intricate mechanisms and systems of visibility become visible precisely to whom they're broken for. In the highly nuanced and simplified state of a crushed paper cup, the object asks not only to notice it, but to be cognizant of what it means to notice it and how what we notice is founded upon affordances given by our distinct position in the world. Material in the immediate environment becomes invisible in its ubiquity and commonness. Situations in their milkiness and subtlety fail to be noticed in full, like wet, warm wind, or the shifting color of light on a piece of plastic in a puddle. Singular experiences that are so fixed to an individual perspective cannot connect to any absolute or global narrative without amassing sweeping generalization. The muchness embedded in a thing's particularity fails to translate in language and becomes illegible. The process of making an object or a painting is a simultaneous distillation and distancing from whatever its source. Every morning he took coal to each office. He had seen a stack of civilians workers passports. This he had presented to me on February 3rd. Why don't you keep it for yourself, David? Desk, container, affix, the box, the shape, the buffer, butter, 24 millimeter spindle, BB30. The thing is, that is the most obvious thing. Who holds the authority? Formal dialogue, how things come about. Separation, distances, SRAM, conversion spacer, plexiglass water seal, backdating, send an email about the dust story, specifying a point, parameters make the slippages apparent, shirking, mother pot, 37 inches and three eighths, I repeated my name to myself, and remembered that I lost 15 years for my age and was now only 23. Did I mean that I was born in 1919 or 1901? The formlessness should make us laugh since laughter is supposed to turn horror away from us. However, the formlessness disquiets us and does not make us laugh. It is therefore that it is not detected as horrible. And in order not to be perceived as horrible, it is necessary and sufficient that it be previously kept at a distance. What can keep it at a distance if not an aesthetic reflex allowing us 
to keep that formlessness in the can by imposing on it a framework and a frame sufficiently solid to deny the nonsense of the non-content. The joke of art, which so often borders on swindle, then joins the art of jokes. Without form, no art, and no art without formlessness. And that's that. Jamie, um, can you tell us a, a, about what you just said? It may be the relationship between language and art, you know, like uh, those were like kind of discrete, were those kind of like discrete observations? You mentioned they were by different people, but are they also things that you've written? And, uh, and do you write in relation to, um, in your creative process? Is that a part of your, your process in making visual artworks? Um, uh, yes, and yes, and then I think yes. I think there are three questions that I'm saying yes to. Um, I, I think of language similar to making an object in that um, both seem inadequate at translating the things I care most about. Um, and then both feel perfectly adequate for other things like um, looking at the surface of something and um, experiencing something uh, that is separate from other things. So in language, you're not allowed to have as much contradiction usually when you're trying to write something and the experiences that I mostly am relating to have a lot of contradiction in them. So that's the way that language seems to fail me. And then in objects, the certainty of the form of them, even when artists try to make them formless, um, also, is the inadequate part. And then putting them both together, which I, um, I, I engage in both of them, um, doesn't, it's not one plus one equals two or something. Um, they're just two separate directions, I think. Uh, arriving at spaces distanced from whatever either thing references. So if I'm writing a story about a tree, the written language gets me like a lot further away from the tree. Or if I'm making an object about a tree, the making of the object is about getting much further away from the tree and um, gaining a distance from it. Um, and I think that I thought that at some point that was about seeing the tree better by getting further away from it. But I think it's more about the difference between seeing and looking, that seeing implies that you have an ownership over something or an authority to understand the thing that you're looking at, but I think it's more important to not um, feel like you have any ownership of the things that you're looking at. So writing and making objects for me in terms of my personal connection to my own practice, not necessarily why I put them in front of other people, but making those things for me as a way of reminding myself um, of not being able to access certain things through anything other than themselves.
there was a statement that you said, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it had to do with tending to objects and how that, um, I can't remember if it imbued them with significance or just sort of representative of their significance. Is that related to your process? Yeah, that's um, attending to objects and places is an acknowledgement of their reality and value. And yeah, I think, I think that that's part of um, why I still care about making an object is that it's, but it's not that um, the object, making the object is not attending to the reality and value of the thing that initially made me want to make the object. It ends up transitioning into me trying to attend to the reality and value of the object that I'm making. Um, but the transition between paying attention to the initial source of the experience or the problem or the visual thing that I, I looked at, the transition from thinking I'm giving attention to that and then realizing that I'm giving attention to something other than that, um, is a point in time somewhere between like the two month process, pre, you know, practice of when I'm creating the thing, it happens at some point during that, but I don't know exactly when usually. Other questions? Do you want to talk about any of the particular artworks that we're uh, looking at in other ways? <laughs> um, yeah, if you uh, pick one, I can say something about one of them. How about the one we're looking at, which is a kind of a blue teardrop? Yeah. Um, so I have to uh, convince myself or give myself like a justification to make something else. And the justification in that was if I can find a blue sheet somewhere in the environment in the next two months, I'll make an object out of it, um, which seems uh, strange to find a blue sheet like hanging from trees or in bushes but I see them a lot. So I knew that I would eventually find one. And um, the form of that object, I chose that teardrop, upside down teardrop form in relationship to the Google Maps pin um, that I was thinking about how this blue sheet, which had a specific location in the environment and in time, um, could register as the Google Maps pin of that specific place. Um, and the, the triangle that floats in front of it that's loose uh, refers specifically to when I found the sheet in the tree, um, it was flapping like that <laughs> over a branch. Um, so a lot of times the visual decisions are really, uh, absurdly and innately connected to like a really fixed experience that I have no expectation will translate into another person's understanding of the thing. Um, but that's. That's why I made that object was I ended up finding the blue sheet that I said needed to be found before I made it. Um, and I was also thinking of the construction fences with the flaps that get cut out for the wind to pass through. Um, and I think in a lot of my work, there usually is some relationship between a rigid structure that is either holding something murky or um, slightly more moving 
And I've always felt like the construction fences that allow wind to pass through so the fence doesn't knock over, um, the cuts that they make in it felt exactly like that to me. And um, this work is titled Location Services and the caption is very specific in terms of the materials used. Uh, Gloria's knitted dishcloth, glues, nails, dark blue sheet from a tree, wood, cardboard, other things. So um, when, how do you determine, how does materiality uh, like come into play? Like how do you determine this array of materials? Um, it changes from object to object, but the material, I, I guess I'll say like in a very general way, I think that as long as I can understand material is not just physical, but conceptual, but ma then material is like the entire fulcrum for my whole practice that it dictates all of the decisions that are going to happen. And that like ancillary information, the textual information in the material list, I consider as um, another form of the work that it is this um, secondary piece of information that uh, doesn't underline the object in any way. It doesn't like bold the object or reiterate the object, but it, it's, an, it's another object. So I try to treat that space as a way to do either um, you know, give more or less information about the thing you're looking at. I think most of the time it's about giving less information, even though it it adds, um, like, it adds text and content. Um, I think it like it ends up. I mean, this is how I think of it, but I think it's about getting in the way in some way of the actual looking that's occurring because you don't know that Gloria's knitted dishcloths are in there at all. <laughs> um, you don't even know that dishcloths are in there. So what is the point in knowing that, I think is a question that I'm always asking myself. And I, I like putting those sort of clues into the material as a way to hopefully encourage that question of um, what does this have to do with that? Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Our last, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, our last presentation is, is going to be last but not least, Marie Williams. Uh, Marie Williams is a contemporary visual artist uh, st who studied at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she earned her BFA in studio practice, specializing in photography and sculpture, and a BA in art history, focusing on, on museum practices. Uh, her work explores the relationship between humans and the natural environment uh, through materials and mediums su such as found objects, metals, woods, textiles, photo processing, and ceramics. Her work has been shown in multiple uh, exhibitions uh, such as the Taste of Art at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder, Colorado, Mumuration of, of Light at Photo, Photo Nola in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, the art, the art Walk in Houston, Texas, and most recently in the Chaplin Contribution to the Tove and Melton and Lisa and Garth and Charles and etc. <laughs> at the Jonathan Hobson Gallery in Houston, Texas. In addition her, her, to her work, uh, Williams is taught at various locations and currently uh, is a teaching fellow at the University of Houston. So welcome to Marie. Thank you for that introduction. And I apologize ahead of time. Apparently they've decided to start working on my house right now. So um, thank you first to the Blafford for your support with the show and organizing these talks. Um, that support has been amazing. And uh, thanks to everyone who is with us today. Um, without you, you know, this, this is not as important. So thank you guys. 
So um, I'm going to start off with, um, in my practice, I use materials to express concepts that relate to relationships. In response to the social uh, and political conversations that are current, um, I have been exploring my position as a white person, a woman, and an artist um, through the lens of my relationships and heritage. I am interested in how wealth is passed down through generations and how wealth is measured. As a young child in Colorado, I spent a great deal of time with my grandparents, learning how to tend to the earth and nature, what a hard day's work looked like, and how a relationship evolved. I make sculptures through constructive, uh, constructing raw materials and found objects being uh, bringing meaning to my work. In my piece, 160 US, um, you can go to the next slide. There we go. The first one um, is made of four bread bags sewn together to construct the body of the shoes and the sole of the shoes is made from cardboard. Neither one of the materials stand up to the elements or perform any real protection if worn in this configuration. However, both myself and my grandfather have worn these materials on our feet to protect them from the elements. I wore bread bags on my feet under my boots to keep my feet dry during the childhood playtime in the snow while my grandfather who grew up in poverty used cardboard to create a barrier between the road and his worn through soles in his shoes. The perfect mass is my visual representation of what I imagine a relationship to look like if it took a physical form. Nine child's tug of war ropes were sewn together in sets of three to create three three-corded ropes. I then braided those together to create a, long, a larger structure. Throughout the braid are several areas of destruction of which I have gone back through and mended with objects associated with the domestic space, such as clothespins, lace, ribbon, tape, and wire. The sculpture is hung on three curtain rods, I'm sorry, three curtain hooks, which allow the body of the sculpture to fall to the floor, similarly to drapery. The end of the braid is left unfinished, referencing the work that is still yet to be done. It is my intention that the sculpture references a tree to show the roots of a tree, or to, I'm sorry, it is my intention that the sculpture references a tree uh, in the way that the bottom of the structure looks like root, uh, uh, roots, as well as reference childhood. These objects are the result of reflection of the conversations I have had with the people whose relationship have influenced my development. Through this examination, I have gained a better understanding of my heritage and who I am as a white artist woman. Um, in the future, I do plan on continuing exploring these concepts uh, through materials uh, beyond, this, uh, beyond this program. So um, I think I finished really early. <laughs> um, do you want to I'm talk okay about some of the other works in the show that we don't have pictures of and just talk about your relation to the, the body of work? Definitely. So like this exploration was really um, a focus on different relationships that I've had, whether it's um, um, like my grandparents or like um, with a lover or even just a friendship. Um, there's also some um, like the table conversations is um, a focus on um, what I, I, I envision multiple relationships looking like. Um, I feel uh, very strongly um, like a lot of the other people around me that um, our society is definitely in transition right now. And um, I, I think relationships and conversations are the most important thing that's gonna help us get through this, you know, respecting each other. And so, these um, little examinations, um, each one of these sculptures is, is taking one of those relationships and, and kind of like digesting that and figuring out what that would look like in physical form. Um, the, uh, there is one a piece called the, uh, the Spice Rack. Um, that one was more of like an interpersonal relationship. Um, so the, there's like a couple different categories that I kind of focus on. Um, some of them are like um, my, not just me, but anybody, like 
man with man, uh, man with artist. I'm saying this wrong. Um, I'm going to say it this way. Person with person, person with nature, um, person in society, person against themselves. And so each one of these um, objects have one of those themes. And so um, the spice rack um, is a, um, it, it looks just like a spice rack. It's constructed of um, theater, of a theater fence post. And through that material, I'm referencing boundaries and how we put up walls between each other. Um, and then the little vials that are on the, um, the structure um, have words that reference the body in some way. Um, some of them are um, like hair color and eye color, um, body structure, height, weights, those kinds of things, these things that we used to kind of like initially, you know, look someone over or even how we look ourselves over. It's, it's definitely based on um, a judgment of some sort. And I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just saying that, that that is like what we do. We, we initially get to know someone and we notice all of the different parts of each other. So, um, It's also um, referencing alchemy in that kind of that kind of thing. So um, that's that's really what my work is about. Not alchemy, but like examining each one of these relationships and kind of digesting them. Do you start with a concept, or or you know, or do you start with the material? Um. So I usually start with a concept. Um. Some sort of question is brought up in my mind um, through situations that I've gone through. And then from that, I start looking at uh, the materials and what the materials can bring to that concept. So they're, they're very much related and um, very important. So if I, like with the shoes, I consciously made a decision to use um, cardboard, um, an element that might not, I mean, it's like, it's, it's around a lot of different places. It's this supportive, you know, material. Um, but because we have so much of it, we kind of like discard it and, and don't think a lot about it, you know, um, on our day by day. So here I am taking this, this material and the bread bags. It's, it's another one of those supportive things. So um, I'm taking those and, and bringing meaning to them. And what new directions do you think you'll explore or what projects do you have coming up? So um, right now I am entertaining um, the concept of my position in the world as far as nature goes. And um, I've been focusing on, um, you know, how to make things more harmonious with nature and, um, still through the lens of materials and um, and that kind of thing. So I'm very interested in the dandelion specifically. And I'm, um, you know, it has a lot of meaning by itself. It has a lot of health properties. And um, I see myself working more with um, outside and growing kinds of materials, plants, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, are there any other uh, questions? Okay, if not, thank you so much, Marie. And thank you to all of the artists uh, who spoke today and also yesterday. Um, again, the, the, the Master of Fine Arts thesis exhibition is up at Blaffer Art Museum through Sunday. So, um, so we have still a little bit of time and we thank you for, to all of the artists and all of the, the attendees uh, for listening to these talks with us. And I also want to thank um, all of uh, my colleagues at Blaffer who uh, kind of uh, helped made the, these uh, talks possible uh, with Amanda Powers and um, also Colleen Maynard. 
uh, and everyone else involved. So uh, thank you so much to everybody. And we hope that you will uh, enjoy uh, the thing, the topics we discussed and, and keep connected with Blacker further. Okay, and come, come visit us, of course. So uh, take care and thank you and good afternoon.